Hi, Chris. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay, cool. Sorry. <laughs> good. Yeah. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. What's up? I don't know. We'll see today <laughs> with all the see who comments and provides feedback. So what's on the agenda, basically? Um, let's see, I'll pull it up now. I think it's just kind of a review of where we are so far. I think uh, VJ supposedly has a presentation too. Yeah. So this is the tag. Do you think I should mention something from, from my side? Sure, yeah. Oh, hi, VJ. Um, yeah, anything you want. Well, I'll just uh, give a brief overview during our part of yeah. the meeting, and then we can all fill in what we think. Hello. Hey, VJ. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Uh, may I ask, how do I pronounce your name? Itai? Itai. Itai, OK. Thank yeah. You. Hi, everyone. Good morning. How are you? Happy New Year. 
still good morning still Happy February. Morning. <laughs> so uh i think today we, we're gonna wait for a couple of more minutes vijay uh, welcome uh thanks for joining in uh we are uh, very excited to have uh vijay from um ebay joining in to talk about their journey uh on adopting open telemetry and also uh, Vijay himself has, uh, as a lead engineer has done a lot of work in uh, evaluating different observability solutions, especially <clears throat> focused on open source. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to his talk. Another uh, topic, welcome Chris. Uh, again, having uh, another topic on the agenda, I think is an exciting one uh, discussing query language and standardization for observability. And uh, again, Chris and Vijay have put forward a uh, proposal for, you know, again, uh, discussing a cross project um, spec that could be then implemented uh, by different projects. But uh, again, before then, there's work to be done. Uh, on the spec itself, right? So uh, again, two exciting topics we have. And again, welcome everyone to have questions at the end of Vijay's talk. Um, Vijay, did you wanna do a brief intro and then we can get started? Sure, Matt, yeah. Uh, Matt, did you have anything else you wanted to call out now or? Um, it, when At the end, I'll give uh, just, just an update of what we talked about last hour around the landscape graph. Okay, I don't, sounds good. And it to take more than like two to three minutes, I got or four minutes. <laughs> okay. I have five cool, slides. Cool. Or it's more just an announcement and an inform. So we can take it now or at the end. But awesome. I'd rather get into the eBay talk. Good, good, good. good. <laughs> Vijay, back to you. Thanks. <laughs> I think you're okay. Good. Let me yeah. Let me share my screen. Uh, okay, uh, everyone's able to see the presentation mode, right? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Vijay Samuel. Uh, I, uh, uh, I'm i uh, the observability architect at eBay. Uh, I've been with eBay roughly 10 years now, uh, uh, serving various roles. I initially worked for eBay's logging platform, then eBay's uh, Kubernetes uh, 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 deployment internally, and uh, now I uh, run architecture for the uh, observability platform, uh, metrics, logs, traces, uh, uh, the whole shebang. Uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, at a high level what observability at eBay means, uh, what has been the past agent strategy that we uh, were following, some of the design changes that we went, uh, uh, went through over the course of uh, about five to six years, and uh, uh, how open telemetry migration uh, uh, was part of that uh, design change journey that we went through, uh, what are the benefits we are seeing out of it and uh, what we are looking to do in the future. Uh, this, uh, for folks who were at uh, observe, Open Observability Day at uh, uh, KubeCon North America, this was uh, uh, the talk that I had given. Uh, so it, uh, it should be very similar in that lens. Uh, so observability at eBay, uh, Typically, uh, developers go through uh, the process of instrumentation where uh, uh, conventionally it was our own proprietary clients, but over a period of time, uh, we have matured to use uh, open source li libraries that are shipped with our managed frameworks. So what is a managed framework? Uh, 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 a bunch of uh, libraries that uh, every developer inside of eBay has for some common languages uh, uh, in order to be able to uh, build applications that uh, power the site. So there is uh, uh, a combination of uh, some uh, boilerplate instrumentation that we uh, ship through these frameworks so that uh, things like uh, the four golden signals and anything else that we feel is useful to monitor across all applications in a standardized manner, along with the, the APIs themselves for users to be able to instrument uh, metrics, logs, or traces. So once they have gone through this process, they do a, a, a quote unquote onboarding where uh, uh, inside of eBay's uh, uh, cloud console, uh, they can go click a few buttons. And uh, if there's a schema that requires onboarding, it, uh, it happens. Uh, if there are annotations that need to go on to the application spot specs, we have control loops that once the user clicks the button, there are some objects that are created on Kubernetes. And then 
the annotation delivery is automatic uh, regardless of how many times they do a rollout. Uh, and after that, uh, we basically harvest uh, through the use of uh, agents. Uh, historically, it used to be uh, metric beat, file beat. Uh, uh, now we are uh, in the process of transitioning all of that into uh, uh, open telemetry uh, collector. So uh, as long as uh, there are some annotations that are seen on neither the part spec or the namespace uh, object, uh, we use that as the required information to uh, start monitoring whenever a pod comes up and stop when the pod goes down. Uh, users then have the capability to set up alerts. So uh, again, they can go back to the cloud console and uh, uh, set up uh, either threshold-based alerts, uh, which uh, get delivered to uh, a handful of Prometheus rule managers that are deployed, or they can do uh, anomaly detection models. We provide the users uh, a handful of models uh, that can understand things like seasonality uh, to be able to do uh, more uh, uh, machine learning, uh, learning based uh, uh, anomaly detection uh, and finally uh, they can they can use our console to also go and uh, build dashboards and visualize uh, so that they can go through the actual triaging process if there were an alert uh, that that were went to fire uh, the scale at which we operate uh, slightly old numbers but uh, we have roughly 1.25 million uh, uh, Prometheus endpoints that we scrape, the 32 million uh, samples per second ingest rate, uh, 1.5 billion active uh, time series. Uh, uh, everything from dashboards to uh, recording rules and alerts, we roughly serve 7,500 uh, queries per second, and we provide uh, one year of uh, raw, raw retention. Uh, again, this is slightly older, but uh, uh, it's still uh, sufficiently large scale at which uh, we operate. So this is the general architecture that uh, that uh, uh, we have for our observability platform. It's it's called uh, it's code named uh, Sherlock.io internally. Uh, uh, towards the left, you see see the uh, uh, application space along with uh, how they are deployed. So we, uh, in our compute infrastructure, we have uh, generic apps as in apps that are written without any managed framework that I was talking about, or drop-in applications like MySQL. Uh, Cassandra or 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 whatever. Uh, so uh, each compute instance has, uh, or each uh, compute cluster has a bunch of agents that are there, and the agents they depending on the signal they either harvest it uh, uh, by either pull or receive. And once the signal is received, we have an ingest here, uh, which can accept well-known protocols uh, like uh, OTLP or uh, Prometheus Remote, right? And depending on the signal, it gets stored into purpose-built uh, uh, storage engines. Uh, uh, a clustered implementation of Prometheus for metrics. Uh, we uh, for logs we use a combination of Ceph and Hadoop. Uh, events and tracing we use uh, ClickHouse. And on the right side, we implement uh, open uh, standards like uh, the Jaeger APIs for uh, tracing, uh, Prometheus APIs for metrics, uh, and uh, those can be used to. Uh, do either anomaly detection or uh, uh, threshold-based alerts using the Prometheus Rule Manager and uh, visualize using our Cloud Console. Uh, we also have something called a probing engine, which is nothing but uh, Prometheus along with uh, either SNNP exporters or SQL exporters that can be used for managing or monitoring uh, load balancers, network devices, and uh, databases as well. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, initially we had legacy APIs where uh, uh, they were handcrafted APIs, uh, very internal to eBay, very proprietary, uh, which can be used to ingest uh, uh, metrics and logs uh, into into the uh, the monitoring platform. And <clears throat> this meant that every user will have to learn those APIs when they come into the company. Uh, uh, but cloud native ingest is uh, more being able to. Uh, be able to use open standards. So uh, with the advent of Prometheus and Prometheus endpoints, uh, we we slowly started to transition the users from using these legacy APIs into uh, more industry industry wide standards. You you instrument with the uh, Prometheus or uh, open telemetry or, or micrometer, uh, you expose an endpoint, uh, which allows us to be able to uh, scrape and collect the information. So to be able to move move to such a model, uh, we need agents. Agents uh, would be able to uh, do the scrape, do any uh, uh, 
label standardization to make sure that all the uh, source label nomenclature is standard across all the metrics that are being uh, collected. Uh, do any other uh, transformations that are required, drop something on the floor, uh, and then uh, be able to ingest it into storage. And this whole process can, within uh, an ephemeral en environment like Kubernetes, is facilitated to the, through the process of uh, discovery. Uh, we should be able to dynamically start up uh, scrapers and stop them uh, as and when uh, the pods uh, keep churning within the infrastructure. So as part of the, so we started adopting Kubernetes uh, around uh, 2015 or so, uh, uh, very uh, early adopters. And at that time, the, the number of options that we had for uh, agents that could actually uh, do the things that we wanted to do at the time were very limited uh, in the sense that uh, uh, Prometheus at the time, uh, we had a sing uh, single Prometheus instance that can discover everything or you had to manually shard scrape endpoints so that uh, you're able to scale to the need. Uh, but at the same time, the concept of a daemon set was becoming very popular at that time, saying that, okay, uh, if you want to collect uh, logs and metrics, just deploy uh, daemon sets uh, so that uh, a given node is monitored by one of those uh, agents. And at that time, when we were looking for viable options, uh, we landed on the Elastic Beats uh, family, uh, file beat, was a lot more mature, metric beat was just up and coming, but the concept of being able to monitor not only Prometheus endpoints, but uh, uh, if there is an application without having to use exporters, just use modules that uh, metric beat had uh, seemed very compelling. Uh, so what we ended up doing is that we started building uh, features like uh, being able to enrich met uh, the metrics and logs with the uh, Kubernetes metadata, and things like that. And over a period of time, we started contributing those things uh, into the Elastic uh, uh, Beats repository as well. And uh, Audit Beat and Heartbeat are two things that we eventually adopted as well to be able to do uh, file integrity monitoring or uh, deploy audit rules so that uh, we are able to capture security events uh, and Heartbeat to do ping port and web check across every uh, pod that's uh, deployed in our infrastructure. So. This is the first pattern that that we followed. A very straightforward one, like deploy uh, agents on each and every uh, Kubernetes node, uh, so that it is able to uh, uh, monitor uh, every application that announces some uh, uh, annotations on its uh, pod spec and report them into the platform via our ingest APIs. Uh, Sorry, but, but there were there were some problems that that were there uh, uh, more well known now uh, in the sense that uh, uh, there is a flat cost uh, per running instance. So uh, whether it be uh, uh, in the case of Beats, uh, to be able to merely spin up the uh, the the pipeline for Beats itself, uh, it uh, costed say fifty MB per instance. So if you have a three thousand node cluster, that roughly translates to uh, one hundred and fifty gigabytes of memory. Uh, to just run the pipeline. And if you have uh, 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 scrape targets, uh, uh, it's uh, 150 gigs plus how much ever uh, memory is required to do the actual scraping. And uh, this does not include the cost of the queue client. The queue client itself to be able to store all the uh, namespace object metadata, pod metadata, uh, if you're enriching deployment, stateful set information, all that metadata, uh, it basically adds into, into that cost. Uh, and the whole premise of using a daemon, uh, a daemon set is that uh, you are going to take a fraction of uh, that uh, Kubernetes nodes uh, uh, resources and it has to be nominal, uh, which would mean that you cannot give like absurd amount of uh, CPU and memory uh, 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 to a daemon set pod uh, because the, the flat cost would mean that you are, you are stealing it uh, from your entire data center at that point. Uh, and while the uh, best practice recommendation is that be very judicious about the labels that you are uh, instrumenting. In reality, people want a lot more, uh, which would mean that uh, if you take something like a cube state matrix endpoint, uh, which sometimes has uh, several millions of uh, uh, time series on the endpoint, uh, those would not be uh, scrapable by one of these uh, 1 GB uh, pods that are being used to run uh, metric beat on that given node. And 
so this this would mean that anyone who has a large metric endpoint will not be able to effectively have their application monitor because uh, you would either rate limit that endpoint or you would just say that uh, let it scrape and then it crashes. And API server pressure is yet another uh, problem that's there. Like uh, there are some objects that are not node scoped, which means that for the entire cluster, you need to bring that entire uh, uh, metadata in like namespace or deployments or stateful sets. Uh, so this, while, while you do it from every node on very large nodes, the amount of pressure that you put on the API server uh, by establishing those watches is substantial. So we uh, moved from that model to a, a cluster, sc uh, cluster scoped uh, scraping. So what we did is we ran a bunch of stateful sets uh, and everyone watch, uh, uh, say if there are 10 instances that are being used, everyone watches the API server, but picks one tenth of the pods for it to uh, monitor. So a simple way to do that, uh, do a hash on the pod UUID, model is the total uh, number of uh, pods in the stateful set and you would, if it matches your current the instance number of your pod, then you basically monitor it or you just drop it on the floor. Uh, this cuts down the number of uh, watches that uh, uh, are needed for the by the API server, uh, but at the same time you are you are you are monitoring the entire fleet with a handful of instances rather than uh, one per each node. So this would be uh, how it would look, uh, uh, regardless of the number of nodes. A hand handful of agents are doing the monitoring and they pick pods. So the advantage was that uh, from a cost saving perspective, given that uh, the flat cost that is there, we have completely eliminated that uh, and uh, more CPUs and uh, 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 a good chunk of uh, memory that is allocated uh, basically uh, works well uh, with the go runtime as well. Uh, so uh, uh, two reasons uh, for the cost to go down by 90%, one, the number of watches that we have reduced and the other one, uh, we are running lesser number of instances now. And uh, by being able to give larger number of CPUs and memory, this also meant that uh, you can uh, scrape larger endpoints without ha having to run into out of memory uh, issues. Uh, but this still uh, was not good enough uh, in the sense that, uh, uh, as I said, like when, a pod, when the pods come up, they scan the entire API server and then uh, they decide to drop stuff on the floor. So if there are uh, a few million pods that are there, uh, each one of them has to go through those uh, uh, few million uh, pods that are there. So when you do a rolling restart of these pods and they do the process of rediscovery, there was a sub substantial uh, chunk of time where it was still uh, uh, coming up. And this essentially would mean that uh, during that time, there are no scrapes that are uh, effectively happening. So if there is someone that is uh, 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 setting up a, a gap alert, uh, the likelihood of them to get a false alert at that point is uh, substantially high uh, because uh, there's no monitoring happening at that point in time. Uh, and uh, depending on how big the cluster is, uh, the more number of instances you run, you still put uh, some amount of pressure on the API server, which is probably uh, uh, not not warranted. Uh, and ha hash mod is a very crude way of scheduling. There is There are a lot better ways in which you can allocate work uh, to a bunch of instances uh, that, that are uh, programmed to do scraping. So we moved to an approach where we came up with an internal uh, agent controller. Uh, so it was a single uh, control loop uh, that is purpose-built for discovery. So whatever logic was there to uh, look at the annotations and uh, um, establish uh, uh, scrape targets. Uh, we basically took that and then ran it as a scheduling control loop. Uh, this would mean that uh, we have a more capable scheduler in the sense that you can look at the parts that are doing the actual scraping and you can do more complicated scrape decision making, like uh, how many endpoints is it already having? Uh, what's its CPU and memory usage? Uh, should I schedule it here or should I schedule it elsewhere? More avenues open up uh, in terms of how complex the scheduling can actually uh, 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 be done. And uh, the config generator can be more uh, uh, pluggable in the sense that uh, one of the things that we did was we wrote this to be able to do the discovery and generate configs for uh, uh, metric beat. 
uh, but when we did the migration to open telemetry collector it simply meant that you uh, implement another config generator on the same engine uh, that is capable of generating uh, hotel uh, service pipelines so uh, uh, this provides us uh, uh, an easy way to move across agents if we actually need to so around the time when uh, uh, open telemetry came about uh, we were uh, discussing how um, uh, we can adopt it for tracing because tracing was just uh, coming up at that point in time uh, and we made a cautious decision to say that uh, uh, we will implement tracing uh, uh, primarily on open telemetry regardless of uh, if it is still stable or it's still uh, uh, rapidly evolving and as a result, what happened was instrumentation was being done with open telemetry APIs and the open telemetry collector was being used for uh, tracing as well and rapid progress was being made for um, uh, metrics as well. Uh, so at that point in time, uh, we were like, okay, it probably makes sense for us to be uh, adopters of the open telemetry uh, collector for uh, metrics as well. And we, begin, we began to uh, spec out what it actually means uh, for us to do an actual uh, migration given that uh, this would this would have to be something that is completely seamless to the end user because the number of endpoints that are being monitored and the number of alerts that are uh, set up are pretty high um, anything disruptive would be terribly noisy and freak a lot of people out uh, in the process so given that we had a, a investment on the agent controller like generating new configs would mean that we are able to migrate. Uh, it should be pretty easy, but the reality was that it was um, a lot more involved than just uh, being able to generate new configurations. Uh, one of the primary reasons for that was uh, that uh, at the time, uh, Open Telemetry Collector did not support uh, dynamic reloads. This is a very powerful feature that we had uh, when we were using uh, uh, Elastic Beats, in the sense that uh, uh, you can have a, uh, a, a reloadable directory that is there, which is scanned every so often to see if the content of the files are changing or not. And uh, any changed file is reprocessed and then uh, configurations are uh, reloaded uh, without having to disrupt the entire pipeline. So this, uh, this feature was very useful to us. It was what was being used by the auto discover uh, or the annotation discovery uh, uh, process uh, that uh, beats at and this was not there was nothing equivalent for that in uh, open telemetry collector the other thing was that we needed extensive testing on the scrape parity uh, the way that uh, 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 prometheus does it uh, we ensured that over a period of time the scrape is very similar in uh, the metric beat side of the world as well and we needed to make sure the exact same thing was the case with the with open telemetry collector as well so through that process we uh, ensured that uh, we submitted prs and things uh, prs and uh, uh, reported bugs to say that okay the, this is what we are seeing is this expected for open telemetry collector if it's not expected then we went in and submitted the prs that are required to actually go and fix it and we also needed to have like a robust uh, regression suite where um, uh, Open telemetry is rapidly evolving. Uh, I think uh, statistics wise, it is uh, the second highest project in CNCF uh, that has uh, a very good uh, commit rate, uh, which meant that we needed to upgrade often and we need to make sure uh, so that we keep up with the with the releases and we need to make sure that we do it in a safe way. Uh, no, reg uh, no regression should creep in when we are actually delivering this uh, across the several Kubernetes clusters that uh, that we run internally. So we did a, a feature mapping analysis uh, in uh, in which uh, there were uh, so a good number of features that uh, already existed, but uh, there were other features that uh, we needed to uh, uh, build and contribute over a period of time. Uh, so we are <clears throat> uh, one of the th things that we consciously decided was that the control loop we would uh, uh, home grow. Um, uh, so that uh, it is uh, easy enough for us to uh, do the migration and we can see how we can uh, open source it at a later point in time. Uh, so as part of the, the critical blocker of not being able to uh, dynamically reload configuration, uh, we uh, came up with the concept of a file reload receiver. Uh, 
so this is a receiver that can watch a certain directory and uh, it can uh, so detect changes in the configurations that are there inside the directory and periodically uh, create what are called uh, uh, partial pipelines. So partial pipeline is uh, nothing but a receiver and a collection of processors that can plug in to the rest of the pipeline that's uh, 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 configured in the in the core configuration that's there. So uh, this would essentially mimic uh, what uh, we had available on uh, uh, Elastic Beats, uh, but at the same time, it will allow us to uh, facilitate the migration as well. Uh, this file reload receiver, we have an open PR. Uh, uh, we are working with the community to see how we can uh, get that into the contrib uh, repository so that other people are able to uh, leverage uh, so the capability that uh, we are using internally. So this is <clears throat> how, oh sorry, uh, this is how uh, the the actual migration from from a configuration perspective uh, ended up looking like. So uh, uh, if you look at the Elastic Auto Discover uh, uh, document uh, documentation, you can define something as code .elastic metrics slash host equal to some uh, templatized variable along with the port that needs to be monitored, uh, what module type to use, uh, namespace is an internal concept that we have which uh, uh, denotes a tenant, uh, how often it needs to be scraped and what is the scrape timeout. So in the in the beats world, this basically translates to a, a metric beat module with all the configuration and uh, the fields are basically translated uh, uh, into some uh, pod, uh, pod metadata. With the open shell metric collector, we 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 did the the closest equivalent that we thought was best in the sense that uh, there is a Prometheus receiver that's there along with the, some uh, attribute processors that can fill up uh, all the required attributes that are there. And we uh, using the concept that we came up with a partial pipeline. We basically uh, say that uh, the the receiver is uh, the receiver that we configured and a list of all processes that need to be invoked in a certain order. And this would uh, plug into the, the exporter that's uh, configured on the main pipeline. <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, scrape parity was very critical to us. And uh, as a result, uh, behind feature flags, we uh, uh, submitted a lot of uh, uh, pull requests that correct the behavior so that it uh, uh, aligns with uh, how Prometheus actually does the does the scrapes. Um, some of it was uh, was how it handled uh, a prefixed underscore, prefixed double underscore, um, uh, how it handles colon, uh, and also uh, some features into the Kate's uh, attribute processor so that uh, we are able to use regexes the way that we intended to. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned, uh, uh, we came up with some automation uh, so that we can perform a scrape with the metric beat, uh, perform a scrape with open trail metric collector, ingest it into our pipeline, and then do a comparison to see if uh, there are any differences. Uh, this would basically allow us to identify if there are different instrumentation patterns that were there that are breaking uh, and uh, see if uh, uh, the community would uh, uh, allow a fix to. Uh, uh, to be taken in for that. Uh, so, so far, uh, at least in the journey, our metric beat migration is fully complete. We are fully on open channel metric collector uh, right now. Uh, we even uh, uh, worked with the uh, uh, community to uh, support uh, uh, exemplars uh, on the Prometheus scraping, uh, which was not uh, present, but we needed it uh, for our tracing uh, ad adoption, uh, which is work in progress at this time. Uh, we uh, are slowly but surely lighting up our entire site with the uh, uh, framework uh, standardized instrumentation uh, so that we can see uh, client calls, server calls, database calls, and whatnot uh, 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 using uh, distributed tracing. Uh, and we are working towards uh, migrating into uh, open telemetry collector for our logs pipeline as well uh, so that we can uh, move out of uh, file beat at some point. And this is something that we are actively uh, uh, figuring out the gaps that are there and we are bridging them and we'll follow the same uh, 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 
test based uh, approach where we validate if there are regressions and then keep moving forward uh so we are uh, uh, other things that we are doing is that uh, we are uh, iteratively hardening our test framework as well so that uh, uh, it is easier for us to deliver new versions into uh, into our uh, Kubernetes clusters. And on an ongoing basis, like we are working with the, uh, the open telemetry collector, the tag, uh, to see uh, how we can uh, contribute better uh, to the grander uh, 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 hotel, hotel initiative. Oh, sorry. So these are they, these are engineers in our team who are uh, primarily, uh, if there are any hotel contributors, you would have probably seen uh, these names uh, either raising uh, Git issues or uh, filing PRs, uh, and they have been responsible for most of the awesome work that they, that that's been uh, talked about in the last thirty minutes or so. Thank you. Thanks, Vijay. Uh, great presentation. Uh, again, let's open up for a few questions, and then we can switch over to Chris and Vijay for the discussion of the query specification and work group. Questions? Well, first, thank you, uh, BJ. <laughs> I just want to say that at the top, but anyway. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, I have a question uh, regarding the storage uh, layer for this uh, architecture you showed us uh, mm -hmm. on, some, on one of the first slides. Um, so what storage do you, do you use? Like what database? Uh, you said that you use the Yager API, right? To, to query. Um, right. But do you use the, the uh, Yager uh, storage like Cassandra or anything like this? Uh, we use ClickHouse right now uh, to be able to store data. We have our own schema, uh, which we have built. Um, and we implement the Yeager proto spec on the, on the query side uh, to be able to access uh, Accept queries in uh, uh, a Jaeger data source. And, and what's your experience with with using the 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 ClickHouse, like uh, scale so wise? Yeah, so far so good. Uh, uh, there is only so much I can talk about with regards to our tracing. Uh, so at yeah. least uh, the open telemetry is like things that I'm approved to talk about. So uh, the there's not too much that I can share about at this point in time. Yeah. Thank you. Vijay, you mentioned that there are some uh, challenges that you know you're still resolving in terms of um, uh, just you know supporting the different types of data through your system, right? It's, there's unification on the tracing side as well as um, um, some of the other signal data in progress. Um, can you talk a little bit about what are some of the scaling considerations that you've kind of had to um work with as you've unified you know these different sources of data uh that you're collecting and you know you uh, through hotel uh like beyond so, using uh you know a specific deployment uh pattern um hmm. are there other considerations that you had to kind of factor in and what was how did you benchmark the performance so I think, uh, yeah. So a lot uh, outside of the open uh, open telemetry collector, uh, uh, at least within the platform, uh, we uh, periodically periodically do uh, profiling. Uh, so we run a continuous profiler on a lot of our uh, at least observability platform namespaces, and uh, uh, there are a lot of interesting things that we always uh, run into, like uh, uh, how we do uh, map delete operations saves like 30 percent cpu and things like that so that is an on ongoing uh, activity that uh, we typically do uh, which we are also having plans to start off on the open telemetry side as well like uh, the the cost of being able to accept spans mm -hmm. and then uh, bring them into the pipeline uh, especially if you want to go to a strategy where it's like you accept 100 percent on the collector uh, generate uh, red metrics sample and then only in just a portion into the platform uh, for that, like uh, a lot of these profiling act activities need to be done on the open telemetry collector side as well. Right now, we feel that uh, it could be a little uh, 
uh, more cheaper than what it is uh, that we are seeing. Uh, but that is something that uh, we intend to work with the community at some point to say, okay, these are uh, probably places where we can optimize a lot more uh, uh, than the way it is right now. I don't have any uh, concrete places uh, in which uh, some effort could be put in at this point in time, but uh, uh, from just observing the CPU and memory utilization, uh, the, there is definitely scope for improvement in that front, I guess. Uh, one of the challenges that is there is that, uh, uh, at least with the tracing, like it's still very, uh, uh, it's still a very new system, like uh, in the in the sense that, uh, uh, do you use a one tier uh, open telemetry collector or two tier? Uh, mm -hmm. how, do, how do you set up red metrics? Uh, how do you, where does the tail sampling fit in? Like uh, these are some things that we are improvising as we see, uh, uh, okay, this probably works better or this would probably cost a lot less than uh, uh, running it uh, in a different way. So I think like uh, more uh, uh, case studies on how people actually went about setting these things up and uh, how it reflected uh, in terms of uh, uh, cost overall. I think that is a good uh, activity that uh, a lot of us can go through to uh, to come up with some recommendations, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, I, I agree because I think that there are uh, at least some common considerations that, you know, again, just having <clears> set up um, hotel at scale as well as the collector, tuning the collector to be more optimal. Did you, did you have any issues with the uh, the footprint of the collector? At this point, that is, did you optimize what you are bundling? Uh, right now, it's not too much of a concern because our sampling rate is uh, close to 1%. But uh, probably once we go to a higher sampling rate, uh, we might see some uh, issues. Uh, at least for mm -hmm. now, the footprint is reasonable. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I, I just want to be aware of folks, uh, people's time. So uh i think we're at we have about 10 minutes say if we run over so chris <laughs> and vijay do you want to introduce the uh proposal and uh, kind of uh, at a minimum we should at least step through it and uh ask folks to provide more feedback mm -hmm. sure yeah um i don't have too much to go over just a quick review as you awesome. suggested did you want to share uh, um Let's see, I can try. Uh, it's been a little while. Chrome tab. Uh, Chris, I think you're on mute. Yeah, Chris, you're still on mute. <laughs> okay, how's that? All right, yeah. now we can hear you. <laughs> Odd, I can't share at the same time. I muted me. Ah, interesting. <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah, I'll figure out Zoom. Um, anyway, so just a quick overview. I don't have to, the doc is linked in the uh, notes for the meeting. Um, we're looking to research the industry around query languages and see if there are any commonalities and determine what the differences are in order to come up with um, a recommendation for a unified query language across various observability telemetry. Um, there's a lot of interest from users that we've seen um, and some interest from vendors around a common API syntax and semantics that makes it easier to um, use different tools in a pipeline without having to rewrite queries and rewrite data sources and all that. Um, so we put together uh, VJ um, and I started this draft document and then we found out that the Thai was also working on the um, OTEP um, for the API side. So we brought uh, Thai in and he's helping awesome. um, towards this effort as well. And then we found out that um, some folks from Dynatrace and Lightstep also were starting up a parallel effort. And so we brought them in to this. Um, so we're trying to gather everybody across the industry who's interested in this um, into a single working group to um, figure this out, hopefully. <laughs> so 
what we've put together in the document so far, and then we've been gathering comments is that first we want to gather a database of use cases. So this will involve doing some surveys amongst uh, various members, doing some in-person interviews and figuring out what people want from a unified query language, of course. Um, next, we want to create a database that kind of does a deep dive into the various existing uh, DSLs out there. Um, we'll start with the most popular ones, of course, and figure out what the semantics are of all of the operators. Things like if you're working with bucketing metrics into a, uh, a range, what is the start time and the end time of that bucket? It, is it inclusive, exclusive, et cetera? Um, and then try to compile the DB of all these operators so that we can, at the end, look at it and see if some are common and see where the differences are. Then after that, we'd like to try um, compiling that list and then see if we can come up with any recommendations for um, standard semantics. Um, and then after that, try to see if we can figure out a recommendation for a syntax. That might be more difficult because there are a lot of ideas around semantics and preferences or a syntax. Um, and then also create a uh, data API and in interchange format so that if users adopt all of these um, or vendors and users, then migration between tools is a lot easier. So we've had a lot of interest from end users so far. We've had some from the smaller vendors. It may be a, um, uh, some pushback from large vendors um, who want to keep users locked into their tooling. Um, so we'll try to deal with that. Um, but anyways, that's kind of the overall goal of the working group. And after feedback from Rita, we're gonna keep the comments open until March. Um, so we gather some more input. We already got the input that folks are really interested in the end products, the end goals of the syntax API and semantics. Um, but I still want to make sure we do some of the research up front so that we have a nice open database that we can share with people. Um, and then the next steps will be officially starting the working group um, at the end of the comment period. Um, and along with this time, I've been socializing this and some of us have around the industry in general. Um, we need to make some ways to uh, participate in more observability meetings. Um, and then BJ had the idea that in March, we should try to set up just a meeting, a remote friendly meeting um, to interview various end users to see what their goals and asks would be. So we could do that and just have a few hours to chat in person um, on a call and gather that kind of feedback. And then we also need to craft survey questions to some of the users and gather more people who want to help out and do some of the research and populate the database and populate the, uh, and investigate where these elements are increasing this. So, any thoughts or questions on this? I, I think, Chris, that's, uh, that's super helpful. Thank you for kind of stepping through some of the uh, goals that the, you know, work group uh, wants to achieve. Um, it might be useful to kind of call out um, some tentative, you know, uh, milestones or talks that you want to publish, like the user survey uh, interviews, because I think that, um, as you know, you know, there are some end users who are super interested, and then we, we could help reach out to other end users who actually could uh, provide feedback as well as leverage some of the existing uh, end user groups that already exist within the CNCF umbrella to also extend the reach because obviously, you know, the more feedback we get from different uh, end users initially in the work group, the better, you know, more um, uh, impactful our work will be in the work group itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds good. And already um, Risi and uh, VJ connected me with the hotel end users group. So I post there and then well, Cool, and, and there's also a CNCF end users group where I can help uh, at a larger scale. Uh, so definitely, um, you know, let's, let's chat.
that would be wonderful. Pranshu, you. you had a question. Uh, did you want to call call that out? Um. Uh, yeah, not uh, not a question. Uh, I I say, but uh, yeah, just more of a uh, 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 something you were just I'd like to share. To discuss. It. <laughs> Yeah, Good. yeah. This this discussion happening on the other document. It was, I think, written by Alois. Uh, he's not here right now, but uh, we are trying to um, basically the philosophy for the syntax is to reuse uh, things that have already been tried and tested. Uh, for example, you know, uh, the command line. For, for example, so we see a lot of piping and a, a, a lot of you know. Um, concepts that have been moved uh, from our learnings on the command line to uh, basically in this document. So uh, we were thinking of, so I'm currently actually working on a POC that kind of relates uh, FlomQL to uh, basically exploring the feasibility of FlomQL expressions. Uh, if they can be fully expressed as, you know, subcommands, arguments, and flags, and if that's not possible, then to which extent is that possible? Because then it would be a breeze for newcomers or even, you know, existing veterans to just, you know, move around and uh, basically have uh, that advantage. Oh, cool. Thank you for working on that. Right. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? I think, uh, Chris, uh, again, uh, the next steps would be to actually figure out, you know, how to reach out and get more feedback, uh, you know, during the comment period and then, you know, also work towards kind of um, mapping out, you know, what we focus on first in the uh, perhaps and, and maybe even build a uh, feature, you know, matrix uh, based on what we have in open telemetry, for example, or, you know, uh, taking uh, some inspiration from some of the feature matrices for compatibility considerations with existing query languages and other factors. Uh, because I think that that might actually help guide uh, without being very prescriptive, you know, help guide some of the key features of, uh, you know, what a query language would look like, common query language, and, and um, in order to bootstrap some of the conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. And Pranch's work will help with that, too. Yeah, so an, uh, another point that, that we, we need to, uh, to mention or to focus on is the incentive from the vendor side uh, to implement such a, such a DSL, su such a common DSL. Um, so, for example, uh, we need to uh, lay out some uh, uh, business use cases uh, where this DSL uh, can bring some really... Uh, high value for for the vendors to implement um, just to 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 lay out the incentives uh, to implement such such a DSL other than than the specification itself. Agreed, agreed, and and I think uh, yeah. it I that goes to um, saying that you know what are the outlining the business cases as well as the. Um, the impact to the end users, right? Because at the yeah. end of the day, you know, especially when there are generations of observability solutions that have been built and deployed in different, you know, organizations, as well as um, um, constant innovation that's coming in from open source, uh, you know, from open source projects, as well as integrations, um, it really are, these are two very powerful influencers on what uh, vendors also build, right? And and I think that at this stage and point, as even if you see the CNCF landscape for observability projects, they are manifold. You know, there are so many projects which are working on you know different solutions or point solutions for specific problems. But what 
th that results with results in which we all agree on is islands of implementations uh, in the end user space, right? And and it is uh, imp really expensive uh, from a cost perspective, you know, in many ways that for end users to be able to take each vendor specific implementation and 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 implement it in islands so i think that the, uh, outlining the clear business case for uh why you know even we are talking about a query specification is super important and we should outline that i, I think you know that's part of the i would say deliverables of the work group itself yeah but, um, agreed so again, all good points. You know, I think we're all super interested <laughs> in this area. So uh, let's make it happen. I think we are at time, or actually, we have run past. So again, I uh, think Matt, I need more than. Do you want to do uh, a quick quick wrap up, and then we can drop off? I think I probably need more than negative two minutes to cover it. There's links three, in the three minutes. You know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you guys want a super high speed, or we could push it to next week, but there's probably 10 slides in three minutes, so it might be a little rapid fire. Um, should we, Go should we do Go it? Go for it. Do a quick poll. Do you want, do you want the, the super fast fire hose or maybe 10 minutes next week? Go for it. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. All right. Can you see my screen? Do you see? Yes. Yep. Okay. Weird. I don't see the same thing. Um, right. So last summer, um, I kind of uh, proved out this is an MVP for this landscape graph. Um, this is going to go really fast, but it aims to answer questions like this. Uh, if I'm an IT decision maker and I want to use two or three projects next quarter, who are all the people that contributed to them? Who do they work for? Who funded the companies they work for and what else do they fund? Like if I care about looking at flow of capital through the ecosystem, or if I care about what projects have had uh, contributor bases that are uh, decaying a little bit and what else have they gone on to go do in aggregate while protecting privacy? Um, questions like this, um, if you look at this, are hard to divine <laughs> um, because you basically have a graph problem, uh, but you've got relational and or rectangular data. Uh, and so just definitions, RDF versus LPG. So RDF is sort of the old semantic web standard. It uses on the left here, like subject, predicate, object, you'll hear RDF triples. Um, we're talking here about a labeled property graph, uh, namely uh, the relationships between things have types and can also have metadata, right? So you can go between the two. It's just that labeled property graphs oftentimes end up more giving you a more useful structure because RDF has a lot of noise because every little property of every little relationship has to be its own edge. Um, so um, the so what we've done, what I've done, or what the project has done rather, is to find a labeled property graph. This is a subset of it. Um, for example, this is that this is us. This is a tag. So people are have a role in a tag, like chairs or tech leads or members. Um, Projects are in scope for tags. Projects can have roles. There's get you know you get the idea. This is a big giant knowledge graph that uses OpenCypher uh, as the query language. And if you're not familiar with SQL for graphs, it's a textual kind of description that lets you write match queries and things like that. Um, uh, there's a layer. I'm going to briefly cover main elements of the tech stack here in the last one minute. Uh, there's a layer that Neo4j open source that goes from an arbitrary GraphQL query to an arbitrary OpenCypher query. This is useful for nested mutations in particular and solving the N plus one problem if you've ever messed around with GraphQL resolvers with relational backing storage. So that's kind of neatly solved. I'll put in the deck kind of just a brief overview. This is in the repo as well about how GraphQL interfaces work. We're using it as an interface definition language. So think it'll to DCOM or, you know, RPC or Corba or any of these uh, proto, you know, uh, same thing. Um, you can also layer in authorization um, into the GraphQL's SDL. So this makes for a nice clean uh, design. Um, there's a notion of GraphQL federation. Apollo has it. There are other open source MIT alternatives I put in here to allow for a super graph to be composed of subgraphs. Um, now, each of these subgraphs can have whatever behind it, but typically a graph database in this case, I think. Um, there's a graph router that was open sourced last summer. It, the previous version of it was a JavaScript thing. And so it couldn't really scale that well, but now it's in Rust and it's open sourced and it's like two to three digits 
uh, orders of magnitude rather better performance, and it can actually scale to larger data volumes. It shards, it does query planning, it reassembles results and things like that. Um, so we have a nice architecture to make uh, a composable set of submodules that this project defines that cover everything from packages to interactions of humans and open source communities to the structure of the CNCF to metadata from GitHub to all of this other data that we have aggregated in the landscape already. Um, we want to have a sub a modular composable architecture so that organizations can mix and match public and private data internally, right? So use some public data sets and, and have a composable way to kind of put Legos together, but also so they can be CI'd and they can be developed in parallel. Uh, interestingly, um, things in one sub schema can reference and make really re re reference to other things because this composition layer is actually a compilation step that ensures that types don't get stomped on and things like that. So it's quite nuanced and quite nice. Um, so the idea uh, was I kind of defined a project and here's a, a rough snapshot. I've defined a bunch of work streams. In many cases, I've proved out MVPs of the design to prove that it, it works along with some alternatives. I've basically got a well-formed project now uh, that just needs contribution um, uh, because uh, my ego is not that big. Uh, and uh, there's only so many hours in the day, but I really wanted to make something that people could engage with. Um, finally, um, we'll talk more next time um, uh, when we, we might have another guest speaker from Quine, um, uh, but, but but graphs in general and this overall stack, tech, tech stack, I believe, is useful for solving observability challenges of various types, security challenges, supply chain, just all kinds of observability stuff can be uh, supercharged and made better with graphs. Um, this domain, the domain of this project is a glorified Rolodex and or analysis tool for the CNCF and tags and project maintainers and whoever else is interested in that in that data. Uh, and it's meant to be non-confrontational uh, and not an observability tool, but a way for people who are interested in the governance of open source and in the CNCF and engaging in the tag or whatever, uh, to be able to get their hands dirty with a relevant tech stack in a way that's useful to the foundation. So that's kind of why I've kind of carved it out with this domain and this tech stack. But again, I do believe this tech stack has broad applicability, and we'll be talking more about that uh, next time uh, on the 14th of Valentine's Day, so we can have a we love graph day. But anyway, um, yes. I've left links in the deck. Um, I'll also say that the Apollo stuff has changed its license since we initially did this design. In some cases, uh, Neo4j as well as some pieces are GPL. The pieces are called out, like the Open Cipher Bridge. Um, that is actually not GPL. That's a that's um, that's Apache. Uh, there is an MIT set of projects out of the guild that have a full stack. I'm using some of them in this project, like the CodeGen. One of the nice things about that interface definition language is you can just pick your language and generate language bindings just like you would with gRPC and Proto. So um, there's an MIT variant to all of this. Um, I started prototyping with Neo4j because it was expedient, but there's a whole bunch of different stuff, everything from UX to project management to design to cognition, to graph theory, to graph data science, to ETL pipelines and stuff like that, that are all in scope for this project. Um, and it's not so narrowly defined that everything's designed. There are some basic ideas that have been proved out and a lot of alternatives. There's still a lot of choices to make and a lot of really cool innovative design work that can be done uh, and, and incubate some really cool stuff. So um, my intention is later on this month uh, to start project meetings. So in our next meeting on Valentine's Day, um, uh, I'll put out a poll uh, before then to the mailing list for anyone interested, and then at the tail end of February, we'll start regular project meetings to kind of define just a normal cadence of triage and things like that. So, um, anyone interested, please reach out. Yeah, Matt, to me. That, this is this is a good mm, short roundup. Thank you for that. And again, I think we're at time, so thank you everyone for joining in. And uh, again, please feel free to catch up on the links that are in the doc. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you again, Vijay, for your presentation and Chris for introducing the spec. Thanks. And thanks. That was thank six you. and a half minutes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Thank Bye. You. Bye. <laughs>